Good afternoon and welcome to FITM's ongoing series, The Future Of. The topic this month is entertainment. I'm Tom Hinkenius, the director of FITM's Bachelor in Digital Marketing, as well as Graphic Design. Um, entertainment, that's where we go this month because it's the month of Oscar. And I think you will find our conversation today pretty interesting, but I wanted to begin with just a pretty basic question. In 2021, what is entertainment? If we follow the numbers, the number one source of entertainment today is actually gaming. As a form of entertainment, video gaming eclipses both film and television in revenues and players spend significantly more on gaming than they would on film and TV. There's still a market for the traditional spaces though, television, of course, the other traditional space being film, but we all know the pandemic has ravaged the traditional places we see film, Pacific theaters, Arclight, I don't know if you saw the news, just announced yesterday the end of the road for those two companies. Both film and TV have obviously been disrupted by streaming, Netflix being the most popular. A recent highspeedinternet.com survey found 80% of respondents subscribe to Netflix. The key thing I think we should take away from the deep penetration of cord cutting though, is the lack of commercials those consumers now see. Six months ago, HBO Max told us they would stream all movies online the same day they released them in theaters. Then Godzilla vs. King Kong did quite well at the box office. So now there's reports that that idea is being reconsidered. Uh, the last source of entertainment that I think we have to consider, of course, is social media. If you're not spending hours on TikTok and Instagram, better ask some folks around how much time they actually are because they are. According to Pew Research, the most popular online platform today is YouTube. An eMarketer report puts viewers from 18 and over with an average of 41.9 minutes on YouTube daily. But is YouTube social? Is YouTube streaming? On YouTube, we watch gamers, so is it a gaming platform? Here's my take. From the get-go, here's what I think you take away from today. It's all converging, which is exactly where our conversations have been going in this series for the past year. We're going to be joined over the next hour by an Oscar-winning visual effects supervisor for his work on The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. He's going to tell you how the same technology used to create your favorite video game is now being used to create your favorite TV shows. Side note, if you have not seen how The Mandalorian was filmed, you are in for a shock when we talk. We're also gonna be joined by a former student of mine. I'm super excited to introduce you to a FITM alumna who appeared on the competition show, Love Island USA. She parlayed that into a career creating content across Instagram and TikTok and YouTube. And she'll describe how she blends all those together with her traditional television experiences. Our first guest though is an Emmy Award nominated executive producer known for his work on Netflix's Love is Blind and Lifetime's Married at First Sight. He's currently executive in charge of programming at Kinetic Content. Eric, welcome. Thank you for spending a little bit of time with us this afternoon. I recently heard you describe yourself as a content creator, which is such a buzzword now. Obviously, your company is successful or is responsible for some pretty successful content, but I'm wondering if you can start by talking to us what you think makes entertaining content. Well, hey, Tom, thanks for having me. And I think I was just trying to sound cool when I said content creator. I mean, I, I'm a producer first and foremost, and and the job of a producer, specifically in the in the space that I work in in non scripted entertainment, is to be entertaining. And I think that audiences today are looking like they are in all forms of entertainment, gaming, social media, film, scripted, unscripted. They're looking for escape, but I think specifically in the non scripted space, they're looking to see themselves on on television and what that what that means for them when they watch a show like love is blind where you know can i see myself in that situation what would it be like if someone was to fall in love with me for who i am as a person on the inside not the way i looked and that's what we explored in that show or on something like a real estate renovation show you know what would i do if i had that budget to renovate a kitchen would i do it that way or would i do it another way so i think mm -hmm. our mind goes to all of those places when they when we think about how we see ourselves. And I think Love is Blind did a great job at that. And this obviously is the trailer from Love is Blind that aired on Netflix. Um, what I think is so fascinating though, when we stay on that topic of Netflix, as, as I already sort of alluded to, it's the lack of access to viewers' eyeballs by brands, which is primarily who, who tunes into this particular discussion. Uh, no commercials. I can watch Married at First Sight on Hulu. I pay the low, low price of 12 bucks a month. I don't see commercials uh, as a brand. Is there a way then that I can access that audience? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on what your brand is and how big your brand is. You know, on a platform, you know, like Netflix or an HBO Max, where you're not going to see traditional advertising, do brands make it on air intentionally? Sometimes, yes. Unintentionally, I think as well. You know, there's a lot of kind of a guerrilla side to the marketing. I look back at my experience doing the first season of Southern Charm in Charleston, Thomas Ravenel, who was one of the cast members on the show back then, was always wearing this particular brand of sunglasses, you know, and I found out later, oh, they're from his friend and he's trying to promote that brand. And it was organic to the story because they were just a pair of sunglasses. I mean, you know, we're trained as producers to not focus in on a logo or a brand and featured in that way. But if it's who they are and it's what they're actually wearing, sometimes brands can make it on air in that way. You know, you've seen it a little bit more overtly, uh, you know, a husband of a housewife might wear a branded hat for the company that he might work for or a clothing line he's trying to promote. And we're trained as producers, as I said, to not let those things come through. I think if you look at the wardrobe specifically on A Love is Blind, you're not seeing people wearing large Ralph Lauren logos or an Under Armour logo. Occasionally you might see a little Nike swoosh here or there, and those things are fine because they're organic to the world and they're not trying to promote something. But there are some ways that people have gotten brands on and, and had exposure. I think if it's a bigger brand, a national brand or an international brand you might represent or work for, you know, there are more traditional ways to get that placement in a show. But I think it's very difficult on a non-scripted relationship docu-series, a lot easier to get that brand into a home renovation series or on a talk show, a news program. And there's there's some ways that you look for that are a little more organic. Like sometimes you just you would like access to places. Uh, right. Yeah. I think that's what I'm more interested in as a producer is access. Mm. You know. So if your brand represents um, you know a place or you represent a hotel chain or you're a fashion line who's doing a runway show, I I want to find a way to get into business with you to be there on your space to be on your event that's already happening organically. And can I set a scene for my show with that in the background, if it makes sense? You know, a, a person who's on my show is attending a fashion show for X, Y, or Z reason. We see the branding at the event. We see the name of the location. We see the dresses walking down the runway. But then the content of the show is not about that brand. It's about something completely different. But that brand's in the mix in a very organic way. And I think what people who represent brands and are trying to place those brands specifically in a non-scripted environment have to understand, you have to be flexible because mm. it's it's not scripted. You don't know what those housewives are gonna say or what those cast members on Married at First Sight are going to say. Mm. You don't know if an argument is going to happen at your event. Uh, so there's a little bit of a risk there in, in, in doing that. But I think if you can be flexible and understand that their behavior doesn't always necessarily reflect on your specific brand and you're okay with that, be okay it takes me back to a discussion we had in the fall about experiential retail right like uh, it's experiential marketing and experiential retail are, are the, the buzzwords in our industries right now so that that obviously works well for us to to do and then of course there's the traditional trade out uh just briefly i don't know if you want to top on that uh what's yeah, a trade out and how it works right trade outs for us are important when we're gonna when we have a high ticket item you know we do a, a honeymoon trip on married at first sight every season or we might do a romantic getaway on love is blind and to move an entire production team to Mexico or to Costa Rica or to Jamaica for a uh, for a week stay that's expensive and you know we work with international and national brands to find ways to get our cast members there for discounted rates in exchange for a visual or a verbal mention of the hotel and depending on the value of that trade what that discount is free rooms or discounted rooms you know you might see the Marriott logo or the you know, whatever hotel we might certainly be at. You know, you look at Love is Blind. We were at the Grand Velas Resort in Mexico. They went ahead after the show aired and created their own package where you could stay in the Love is Blind suite at the Grand Velas mm -hmm. and marketed it back to their consumers for people who are looking to stay at the same resort where the casting stayed on season one. Mm. It's, it, is, it is interesting to think about, as, especially as we look at some of the clips uh, from the shows you've produced, uh, just how it might work. You've kind of implied that the, the paid product placement is becoming the hardest way in. Uh, first of all, is that, am, I, am I quoting you well? well? I, I uh, think do, you think, do you think it would always be the case? Yeah. I think it's difficult because for me as a producer, I'm not incentivized to put a product in the show. But to mm -hmm. me, that the, the money is not coming to me. I, I'm there to make a great show and create 
content and create an entertaining product. And if a product placement, a paid product placement needs to happen, it's always going to come through our network partners. They're the ones who are going to approve it. And if by doing that integration or that product placement helps the overall health of the show and the production and it helps the network out and we're good partners that way, then we'll find the most organic way to make that happen, to execute that and get that on screen. Mm -hmm. I'm much more interested in access to cool places and interesting people. And if that helps support your brand, that's what I'm more interested in. I'm not, I'm not interested in getting a check from somebody to put a piece of product in a show. That's going to be a lot more of a traditional route through a network. If I'm bringing that pitch to you though, that you're talking about, like, does it make, uh, does the hundred thousand dollars saving on your production, does that, you like that sound or that's I like, mean, that's eh. great. Right. That's okay. great. That allows me to do a honeymoon at a, at a five-star resort that might break the production budget. Otherwise, you know, yeah. certainly we can afford to go to most places, but if we can elevate and get something premium, premium and do it in a way that makes sense for us as the production doesn't tarnish the brand of the network we're working for on whatever show it might be and also helps get the exposure to the resort if we're using that as a specific example then that's a win-win-win for everybody do netflix and hbo max ever sort of change their tune on this do you think well i've been thinking about that and i think there, there is going to be a moment where there's a crossroads certainly where they're going to have to decide how to deal with the prospect of ad revenue. You know, there's going to be a point when all the people in the world who are ever going to subscribe to Netflix are now subscribers. And then there's gonna be a point when Netflix doesn't feel comfortable raising the, the, the monthly fee because they'll start losing subscribers. And so once that level is reached, peak subscriber, peak price point, then where do you go to look for revenue? Is it pre-roll ads like you might see on a YouTube clip? that are customized and individual, maybe that's interesting. Are there other ways to slide in product placement or integrations into a show? I think yes for some shows. Other shows, I don't think so. There are certain shows that I think will be untouchable, but I think there are, there are a certain tier of shows where that might make sense, as long as you can do it in a, in a very organic way. Let's flip the script then, so to speak. If when that does happen, what challenges would be confronted? So you're talking about authenticity. That's it. I mean, that's the big one yeah. for me is authenticity and and making sure that the brand, because specifically talking about non-scripted content, you're gonna you're gonna have a little bit of understanding of how your product's gonna be featured when you do an integration, but there's always that risk, right? So as I was talking earlier about being flexible and and knowing that the chance to have that exposure is going to be beneficial to you, but knowing you're gonna have to release some control, um, that's gonna be a challenge for I think a brand to accept that. But really for me on my side of things, it's about how do we fold in a product into a show that makes sense? You know, you look at Married at First Sight, it's a wedding, that's big business. We need venues, we need a honeymoon location, we need rings, we need a wedding dress, we need a caterer, we need flowers, we need a limo. All of those things are, you could go and look at national brands or local brands in any one of the cities we might produce the show in. So there's different tiers, but I would look for, a partner who wants to bring wedding dresses to the show because we're going to have that anyway. So if we can find a way to feature an interesting brand that has a new take on a on a, a new silhouette for a wedding dress, I'd love to see that on the show and push the form forward as it makes sense. And it, it also can feature a really interesting, unique brand versus just like going to, you know, a, a bigger box store where you're going to get the same thing over and over again. There's another side to this also. I've heard you talk about Bethany Frankel in this in this way, but the star bringing his or her brand or diving off into their own brand. What are your thoughts on that as a, as a business model? Well, I think that's another way in certainly for marketers and brands is to track down the talent that you're interested in representing much in the same way you might do with a social media influencer. Those people are going to end up on traditional television. There are opportunities for them to use your product potentially. That's a way in. There's also an opportunity for people who are talent on shows to create businesses. Yeah, you know, the Bethany Frankel of it all. You know, she basically launched Skinny Girl on Real Housewives of New York. And, you know, clauses existed that allowed for profit participation for future profits on businesses for talent. She carved that out of her deal very wisely and then, you know, went on to sell Skinny Girl for over $100 million. And, you know, now, looking at any talent that comes into a non-scripted uh, 
production, that clause is in there and it's pretty ironclad. It's not really negotiable. You're going to give up a certain percentage of future profits on new businesses you create to your network partners. I don't participate in that as a production company, but the network does mm-hmm. because they're giving you a huge platform. Um, and that's, that's another way in too, is you could create a whole show about your company and your brand. If you can do it in an interesting, authentic and real way with a big enough hook that's going to get a company interested. You know, you look at, you know, an OcuSoap, look at Vanderpump Rules. I mean, that's a show about young people in LA, but it's also a show about what goes on at a real working restaurant and bar. And it was hugely, is hugely popular and obviously blew up Lisa Vanderpump's business in a big way. And I'm sure she did very well because of that. I, I may be the only one who was not familiar with that term, but you called it an OcuSoap? Sure, yeah. Like it's, it's you know, it's an occupational docu-soap. So it's a, it's a docu-soap that takes place in someone's occupation. So and uh-huh. I, I keep referencing Bravo shows, but there was a show a couple of years back called Timber Creek Lodge. And it was, mm-hmm. there was a cast of characters that lived at this resort up near Whistler. And they, you know, it was a real place where you could go and stay off camera. Um, even Below Deck, another Bravo show is in a way about a business. It's on a boat. And and you're seeing that brand, you know, and now do people want to hire Captain Lee to take them on a cruise off camera or on? I'm sure they probably do. Um, it's, it's fascinating. I, I could keep talking to you, but I want to introduce Carol uh, right now. So a, a reminder to everybody to hit the Q&A button at the bottom. Eric will rejoin us at the end uh, and take any questions as well as Carol. Um, it's, it's great to see a FITM alum who since graduating from here appeared on Love Island um, which led to who, a growth, huge growth in her social media following. She has parlayed that into a growing business as a content creator and influencer. I'm so excited for you to be able to join us today and spend a little time explaining sort of this space and, and what it means to you. I, I want to start though with the same question I started with Eric. When you think about the content you're creating, what do you think makes entertaining content? Hi, Tom. Thank you so much for having me, first of all. And to answer your question, I really think that entertaining content is what makes the audience engaged. So when I'm trying to create like fun, entertaining content, I'm like, how can I get my audience to engage with me? So what Eric said, I think it's really about being relatable. It's like, how can I get someone to be like, oh, I felt that, oh, I wanna be there. How can I make someone relate to me? Because, you know, when you're in your phone, you just like scrolling through Instagram, you may pass like a post and you're like, oh, whatever. Cause that wasn't entertaining cause that didn't engage you with the post. So I'm like, how can I engage my followers with my content? Excellent. Um, I-, I wanna level set a little bit with you also is what the business of influencing looks like. Um, I don't wanna get you into any trouble and I don't want you to give away (laughs) too many secrets, but uh, tell us about how you actually make your money. What does this work? Okay, so as an influencer, you know, um, what an influencer means is that you have an audience on a social media platform. So on Instagram, I have 480,000 followers. On TikTok, I have 150,000 followers and YouTube, 32,000 subscribers. So I know that I have all these people watching me. Yes, I see them as a supporters, but I also see them as potential customers to whatever I'm going to sell or whatever I'm going to promote. So brands also recognize that they're like, okay, she has all this audience. So let me put in my product and make some sales. So basically how I make my income is partnering with brands that resonate with my brand. So it's like a nice partnership. We both kind of benefit because they're helping me out with, you know, my bills with me paying, but I'm getting some products that I believe in and my audience also believes in. So I make money with um, posting, you know, photos. Most of them is like what I'm wearing, but what I really like is partnering with brands that actually have products because they pay so much more like skincare hair products they pay more because it's based around a campaign it's based on a product launch so they like reach out to me they're like okay we need you to tell like to tell your followers that we're launching this product please promote and talk about it so that's how I make my money and also YouTube I'm trying to get there I'm kind of slow behind but I'm trying to get there because there you can get paid with ads actually putting your ads into your videos and partnering with brands as well. 
when you, I had to turn off the sound on a computer. Sorry, I was listening yeah. to you. I just had to look away. Um, <laughs> I forgot to mute. Uh, so let's let's spend a minute on that. Like you're growing the YouTube, right? So the currency on TikTok, the currency on YouTube, okay. it's more about education and entertainment than the Instagram work you've been doing. So I have to imagine that also means a lot more work for you. So maybe walk us through those differences. Yes. Okay. So I'm first, I do want to say like all social media platforms do serve the same purpose. It's just, it delivers a different way. Right. So with Instagram, it's easy. Post a photo, post, post a filter with the caption easier. But when it comes to TikTok, YouTube, you got to show you, you got to be, you know, authentic. You can't just like put a filter on it and call it a day. You have to give a bit more. So that creates a lot of more work. You know, I have to figure out how can I make, you know, this uh, product placement, this promotion authentic. How can I integrate it into my video and not even let my audience know that I promoted it, you know, but also I need to figure out, and that's the tricky part. You need to be able to find brands that like you genuinely want to work with. You know, because then it makes it much easier because they're actually just helping you out in so many ways. And that's the authenticity piece, right? Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. I think about yeah. Anastasia, we talked about this in class, right? and I've told this story many times, I think even on this, but the Anastasia Beverly Hills, she built her brand by finding the followers and supporting them, right? Like that's yeah. sort of launched this whole influencer culture, which I think is Exactly. Wise, right? Because it's like being an influencer, it, the whole influencer marketing, it gives you this um, friend recommendation. All your followers are kind of your friends. So it's like they're watching you and being like, okay, she's giving me some advice. I'm going to take it and buy it. So if I'm just going to get a product that I don't believe in and I'm just trying to sell and they get the product and it's really bad, they be like, I'm never trusting this girl again. And then I lose my audience. So you really need to find a brands that you actually would buy. Like I would actually buy this product and I'm just sharing with my followers and I'm getting paid for it, you know? Right, right. So, okay, so then you also have now learned or are, are blending together what maybe we'll call traditional media with this content creation social media space that yeah. you're playing in. So going on Love Island, how did that appearance align with this brand identity that you're trying so hard to create and hold on to? Yeah. So, well, when Love Island first reached out to me, because I actually had a following before. So I had 250,000 followers on Instagram before that. So at that point, I already saw myself as a business because by the day I'm a business, I'm making my own money. Right. So I was like, how does that show align with my brand? Because now it's two brands merging together. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, my following, a big part of my following came from a relationship that went viral. So I was like, okay, so my followers already know about my love life. So going into Love Island would only enhance, you know, give, allow me to promote myself in a different platform and a different perspective to my followers and gain more followers from the show. So it kind of benefited me because I was able to promote myself in more platforms than just Instagram. Now I'm on TV. <laughs> so that helped. It's, I, I love the way you have thought this through so I fully. really did. I'm a businesswoman yeah. at heart. <laughs> yes, yes. I appreciate that. Um, what did you learn from the traditional entertainment? Because you started with social and then went to traditional. So what did yeah. you learn over there? Okay, so one thing that I really learned is transparency. That is something that is so valuable. You know, like if a business can be like transparent, especially as an influence, influencer, being transparent would really create that connection with the audience and that creates, not trying, that creates sales, okay? Because if someone trusts you, they're going to buy something. But it's because you're being yourself, you're being authentic. So being on reality TV, you can't edit something out. You can't put a filter on it. You're being who you are. And people are seeing you for that and they can relate to you even further. You know, because on Instagram, I was so used to just like posting a photo and that's it. They didn't know yeah. me. They don't they didn't know me on a deeper level, but going on reality TV, they were able to connect with me. And that's what I learned. I was like, I need to bring that into my channel on YouTube, on my stories, on my captions on Instagram. Be more me because that's how people connect to you. I got it. I got it. Eric was talking about the product, the paid product placement. 
Um, yeah. And that could be perhaps a future, maybe for some Netflix shows, mm -hmm. um, paid content though is at the heart of what you do. So like if we're flipping the script, script, what's the lessons you would share with TV executives about how to make it work really well? Okay, so I mean, when it comes to reality TV, like what Eric was talking about, it's kind of complicated because you can't just stop, you know, whatever is happening. You can't stop someone fighting to like put in that product placement. It's harder. However, I feel like they could, um, in the Married for Sight, for example, there is activities such as relationship bonding, because I'm a big fan of Married for Sight. So I know that couples, you know, they have activities where they have to, um, like, ask each other questions and so on. There's a lot of products that are for relationship bonding, such as like those intimate play cards. They maybe could find, you know, like a product that sells those kind of things and then put that into you know, this scene and it will be natural, it'll be organic and it actually would enhance the show because it's like, oh, this is a fun play card game. Or like, um, I don't know if you guys heard about HelloFresh, but it's like this um, service that they sell like prepackaged ingredients and it comes with a recipe and you make the meal. Married couples, now they're living in a house together. They have to cook, you know, live life, normal things. HelloFresh comes in, it comes in this big box, written HelloFresh on it. They make their meal and that's a product placement, but it's organic. It's not like they have to go and talk about it. It's just naturally in there and actually kind of like enhances the show a little bit because it adds like a different activity to do that comes from like a product, you know? Well, and, and when you say that, it, it like my sister uses HelloFresh. So there is, to your point of authenticity, there is an authenticity of that, that a family yeah. would access HelloFresh to help make dinner that night, right? So exactly. It's that's All what you think. Real. Yeah. It's about making it as real as possible or else audiences are going to be like, oh, I don't like the show no more. They're just trying to sell things to me. So it has to be organic. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. All right. Um, Carol's going to stay with us as well. So submit your questions via the Q&A link at the bottom. Thank you. This is so interesting to hear from you. Um, our last guest this afternoon is Steve Preak. He's an Academy Award winning visual effects artist for his work on The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. I believe he is on with us and we'll ask him to turn his camera on. Um, hi, sure, yeah. hi, Steve. Great to see hi. you. Um, I wanted to add you to today's conversation because when I think about specifically the future of entertainment, I really think you are working in the heart of that future. Um, I, I wonder if you can tell me a bit about your field and where it's come the last 30 years. I specifically start with 30 years ago because that's when Jurassic Park was ish released. Um, so walk us through where you've come. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's uh, it from back in the day when, um, you know, directors spent a lot of time uh, prepping the shoot and getting ready for something where you're only going to have a handful of minutes in a, a visual effects movie like Jurassic Park, where you know, it didn't have a ton in it. It was only a, a few minutes worth of visual effects in it versus nowadays where for a similar budget, you know, you're asking, they're asking you to put, you know, 90 minutes of visual effects into a film um, and on set, the response to the needs that you have is, we don't have time for that, you know, like just figure it out later kind of thing. So we've definitely become much more flexible in terms of um, uh, what we're asked to do as well as, how prepped we can be to do it mm -hmm. um, and the budgets are coming down and and just like I guess probably every industry but yeah we, we finally get into the Jurassic Park video here but basically what you're telling me is this this four minutes of visual effects was all we got out of this movie where all they talked about was visual effects yeah I mean it was you know that was the big thing about this movie and this movie got a lot of people into visual effects and it was a you know, originally this movie was pitched to be done with stop motion and the guys at ILM, Steve Williams and, and um, uh, Mark DePay, they sort of did this test uh, where they showed a, a, a computer generated dinosaur walking and Bill Tippett, who was sort of the, the master of, of stop motion at the time, um, actually made a comment uh, offhanded when he saw it that said something along the lines of, you know, you just made me extinct or something like that. And there's actually a line near the end of, I think it's near the end of Jurassic Park where he says something about being extinct or humans are gonna be extinct or something. And, and it, was a, it was a small jab at, at um, um, uh, the stop motion world and the comment that, uh, that he had made. 
So, so let's explore where this goes from here because you introduced me to something that I had no idea about. Apparently I went into watching The Mandalorian just uh, like an idiot, I guess, I don't know. This is shot in something called an LED cave. Can you describe, and we have a gift to kind of make sense of what this cave is. Yeah, so, so as you can see, the trusses and everything are, are sitting there and then there's a, a sort of wall of LEDs around this room, which you can kind of get a sense of the space there that, you know, if he's a six foot man, that's probably a 60 or 80 foot um, room. I didn't work on Mandalorian myself, but this is sort of a big um, thing happening in our industry right now. So rather than shooting on say a green screen set and replacing it all later in post or going out and, and doing a whole production design and building your environment or you know being on location or renting stage space or something and building this whole room you basically you you can it's, it's, you, you can see the little green camera moving around that represents um a, a digital tracking of a real camera so imagine you go into the space you're showing on these LED walls, you're showing, in this case, the room that the stormtrooper is standing in, and your cameraman that's holding a real physical camera and actually shooting the real stormtrooper is moving around. And in real time, you're tracking that camera and putting on the LED wall what should be there correctly rendered in real time with correct perspective and so on. Um, it's, it's just, I, I mean, I, hopefully I'm not the only one who's totally blown away by this. Um, <laughs> What what I think was interesting also is you were telling me about how it, the COVID effect of this really kind of blew up the use of it as well. Yeah, so it was already like Mandalorian season one had already been shot and then done in post by the time uh, COVID hit. Um, and there was already sort of um, some movement in the industry about it because it could potentially save you a lot of money of flying entire, you know, crews all over the world and, you know, taking to different places where you know you have to bring actors and crews and all sorts of stuff um and, and just by the way you can see here so they would build this spaceship as a little set piece here and then the entire town in the background is rendered real time as you move the camera around you get your perspective changing so the only thing that really exists is the spaceship these couple little things um, on the left and your actors um, anyway so mm -hmm. when COVID hit there was a lot more desire to not travel the world, even scouting, like scouting is something that, you know, you're often taking, you have your director, your DP, your visual effects supervisor, your production designer, your, you know, you have a, a, a host of 20 people that are flying around to locations, driving around in vans together and all that stuff. And all of a sudden, all the different unions are like, you know, you're not allowed to do that anymore. So, or you, you can't even travel outside the country. So now how are you going to shoot a, a movie that takes place in Africa or something like that? So. Mm -hmm there was a big push about, you know, maybe we use <clears throat> these LED caves more and more um, to combat the, the spread of COVID. It's, 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 so, it's so fascinating. So let's talk about the limitations then of these. And I think you kind of hit on it already a little bit, but, but basically it, what's, what's the reason not to do it? What would be the reason you wouldn't go toward one of these? Well, there's a number of reasons actually. I mean, the, the biggest one in my mind is that you have to make a lot of decisions before you start shooting, right? Like if you look at that, if you look at we're just what we're just looking at, that whole city that exists or that whole little town that exists past the spaceship, you know, they're going to shoot the actor on that day and you have to have a fully renderable, lightable asset that is built in 3D that is prepped in the uh, Unreal Engine to be rendered in real time ready on that day. So that means whoever has designed that town and whoever has decided what colors it's going to be and what the materials are made out of and all that stuff has to have done it early enough so that the visual effects team can build it, texture it, light it, and get it ready for the environment ahead of shooting, which when you shoot on a green screen, the exact opposite happens. You know, you have somebody that's done some concept art with it and then they go, we're, we're just going to go shoot green screen. So we don't necessarily really care what's going to be there because we can decide that and post, you know, three months after the director's cut has come, you know. So you're kind of tying your director is probably the most difficult of the people, but you're, you know, you're trying to get answers out of your director and your production designer a lot earlier than you may normally have to. Um, it puts me a bit in the mind of like the old movie, Wag the Dog. Uh, do you remember when they, right, she's carrying, they, they, what does she carry? I don't know, give her a thing of, of Lay's potato chips right now. And then they take it out and they spit it, the dog, no, a cat. Uh, the, but you can't, you're saying you can't do that now. These decisions are made in advance. To, to use that technology, yes. 
I mean, what you'll what you end up seeing is that you know traditionally you have a green screen which you can key and you can put whatever you want behind them. And so now what's happening is hopefully a majority of your decisions are made. But if something comes up, then instead of having the green screen to key off of, you roto your actors out and do this process called roto where you sort of draw splines around them and you extract them from the plate and you still have to make the change it's just a little bit harder now that said one thing you can do is if you if you're looking there on the day and you go like you know what i know we built all this and this is what we decided on but actually now that we see it in camera like we really don't like it you just turn the led screens green and then you have your green screen there so you you can sort of back out of back out of it last minute if you want but of course, you've wasted a ton of money and time and, and energy. So, wait, we all thought that's what Hollywood does, right? Is not. Oh, we're really good at it. Yeah, for sure, hundred yeah. <laughs> percent. I mean, there's other technical limitations on those stage, the screens. Like, this may only, you know, make sense to people who have dealt with cameras and so on. But, you know, like when you're defocusing with your real camera and you want defocus happening on this on the screen, you have to make those two merge and. And so you like, if you have defocus happening from your actual physical lens, and then you are also applying defocus on the screen, but everything that's on the screen, as far as your real camera is concerned, is at the same distance. So that's all going to get the same defocus. And defocus doesn't add linearly. Your bokehs don't change linearly. So all of a sudden, your, your defocus, for example, is one of the things that doesn't play well in that space. Hmm. But Again, there's a bunch of limitations that are technical limitations, but it's still a very interesting space. Um, I, maybe we'll come back to that in a second. I do want to talk a little bit about your work on the curious case of Benjamin Button that won you the Oscar. Uh, I, I've heard you talk about that when the film first came out, the director, David Fincher, didn't allow the visual effects to be discussed at all. And this is, of course, the, the film where Brad Pitt ages backwards. Uh, but no discussion of this in the marketing or the promotion. I, I, the reason why fascinates me. I wonder if you can talk about it. Yeah, well, the main reason I think is because in general, the um, the world doesn't really like visual effects in general. I mean, they like it in the sense that they go pay money and watch Marvel movies, I guess, and those make billions of dollars. But, um, you know, that's something where you're sort of paying to see sort of a CG spectacle. And, and if those are done badly, like is oftentimes people think like the DC universe is not done nearly as well as the Marvel universe, they get panned, the visual effects were terrible and all that kind of stuff. So in, the, in, in this situation, David Fincher, who is traditionally not really a big visual effects filmmaker, um, you know, he wanted to make sure that people went to his movie to just watch the story and not, not go to see the visual effects. Mm -hmm. So he didn't want anyone talking about the fact that Brad Pitt you know, wasn't in the movie for the first hour um, and that people would go there specifically to see this sort of, you know, short version of Brad Pitt that was done digitally. So we weren't allowed to talk about the visual effects until it had run its course in the theaters and an award season came up and then we could sort of talk about what, what was happening. Mm. There, there is something also in this that gets almost into like theory and and psychology uh, that, that you were talking to me about recently, and you call it the uncanny valley. I wonder if you can explain what that means as we move along this trail of uh, fakes, sure. if you will. Yeah, I mean, the uncanny valley was certainly not a term I came up with. It was a, a Japanese roboticist, I think, that came up with it. And, and it, was, it was definitely our biggest concern on Benjamin Button, because up to that point, there had been nothing that people felt like was a sort of believable human rendering, like, you know, things like Final Fantasy or, or Beowulf or Polar Express had been done, all which lived inside what's called the Uncanny Valley, which is where there's a relationship between your comfort level with something and how human it looks. So as something becomes more and more human looking or more and more anthropomorphized, you sort of have a better and better association with it. You like it better. So like a teddy bear being bipedal and standing is, is more appealing than a, a teddy bear that would be on all fours, for example. And this curve kind of has a relationship between your acceptance of it and its, its, its um, relationship to a human being in terms of, of uh, anthropomorphization. I think we have an image. Let me see if I can get them to pull that up okay. to show so you can kind of describe yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and then what happens is right, right before you get to human, you drop from this, what they're measuring as affinity, 
you drop into the, something that's like disgust, which is something you can, if you look at any of the sort of modern robots that they've tried to make, you know, interact with human beings, or, you know, we, we just heard from a, an influencer. I know there is a, I think her name's Michaela or Michaela or something like that, which is a, a fully digital influencer. Right. Um, it, it, to me, super creepy, but you know, I mean, that's, that's maybe because I'm, in this industry, but it drops into this, what we call the uncanny valley, which is, is sort of a disturbing looking human. And then it jumps back out and gets to real human being. So when we were working on Benjamin Button, that was our fear was that we were going to fall into the uncanny valley. And, you know, I mean, I feel like some shots were successful and some shots to me still live in the valley. Um, certainly other movies I've worked on have the same issue of going in and out of the valley. I mean, like I mentioned Final Fantasy, which was one of the movies I worked on, which I think pretty much lived completely in the uncanny valley for the entire film. Um, but it's, it's uh, this is the, the sort of bane of doing human, CG humans. And when it's so interesting too, you mentioned this and it's funny when you see this concept, right? We, we just talked about it. And then now I'm seeing, I think it was the NYPD brought out this morning, its first robotic dog. And it reminded me of the same space. Like, oh, I recoiled from this robotic dog being yeah. walked by a, a police officer. Yeah. Um, it's just very odd. Uh, I just, I also want to put in a quick plug. Uh, you mentioned David Fincher, who is, of course, the director of the film Mank. Um, we're having a conversation on Thursday with the production designer and set decorator, uh, Don Burt and Jan Pascali. We'll send out a, a, for everybody out there, we'll send out a link for you to RSVP to attend that. Um, but that that's coming up on Thursday. It's interesting though, when you talk about uh, Fincher and in talking with Don the other day in preparation for this discussion on Thursday, his, his commitment to the every detail, I think maybe is that the right way to put it, is so interesting to me. Then when I put the pieces together that you were on Benjamin Button and this uh, Mank obviously this year, which is the one that takes you to Hearst Castle and 1930s and 40s Hollywood, um, it, it, I, I, I almost couldn't see Fincher doing both films. It doesn't seem equated because I almost feel like in a way, are you going to put the set decorator out of a job or are you a partner? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I think Fincher is a very particular example in the sense that he is super involved in everything and he knows exactly what he wants from every angle. So in some ways, like from a visual effects standpoint, it's good and bad in the sense that he's very good at telling you what he wants. So at least you're not just, you know, you're not getting the note that's like, eh, it's not what I want. So try something different, which is like, well, what does that mean? Um, so he's very specific about it, but the flip side of that is, you know, he's very particular. So if it is wrong in any way, um, you know, you, you'll change it again and it'll be down to how far a shadow falls down a wall on a CG tree that you've added to, you know, like it, very, very specific things, um, which I'm, I've talked to his VP or one of his, or a couple of his VPs, um, and they say the same thing. It's like, in some ways it's easy because, you know, here's where he wants the lights, here's where he wants the camera, here's what he wants the camera to do. And you're just sort of executing it like a, like a, you know, DP robot to some extent. But then again, that's what he wants to do. So if you can't get what he wants, then, then the Doberman Fincher side comes out of it. So... <laughs> Um, it's, uh, it's a good and bad thing for sure. And I'm sure that I would imagine the same thing goes for his set decoration. Yeah. The last thing I, I'd like to bring up with you before I invite everybody to join us again and, and take some questions from the audience is, is just as it sort of relates to the marketing space, which is where I spend most of my time, because that's what I teach here at the college, um, and, and deep fakes. I mean, you even mentioned the, uh, the influencer that is not a real person. Um, I, I think about, you know, we, we talked a little bit before about Stan Lee, he's now deceased, but it doesn't mean we're going to stop seeing his cameos. Well, what, where are we with this? Where does this work you're talking about lead us? So I mentioned the Uncanny Valley, which is sort of what my industry has been battling with for, you know, 30 years. And it's been very difficult because we've had to make everything completely CG, but with deep fake now you're using, you know, computer learning and computer vision to basically take real footage and just manipulate it in, in sort of camera space to get something that's realistic. I mean, it's, it's definitely an evolving technology and it's come a long way, even just in the last 
three or four years, it's gone from something that is, you know, full of um, artifacts and issues to something that, you know, uh, you're going to be, I'm sure, seeing this in, you know, politics and advertising and all sorts of stuff where, you know, are you, did George Bush really say that or whoever, is, you know, maybe George Bush is dating me a little bit here, but, um, you know, whether it's a, uh, which one H W or W? Yeah, or somebody saying something that they didn't say, or like whatever. Um, and you know, same in advertising. I think we talked yesterday about you know, it's like, like you bring up Stanley. We recorded Stanley to be prepared to make him fully digital, but now I mean, there's already so much footage of Stanley out there that it could be done with deep fakes much much easier. And then I mentioned to you yesterday that now deep fakes are also happening in the audio space, so you can mimic somebody's voice as well so i would imagine it's going to be very very difficult in the not distant future and and when i mean very difficult i don't mean just somebody watching something on facebook i mean somebody who is a um, image specialist who is trained to determine if an image is fake or a video is fake it's going to be difficult for them to determine if something is real or fake which is Definitely a scary world in terms of you know politics and stuff. Maybe not so much in advertising because you know we like doing the crazy it. things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, right. Yeah. I, I want to invite um, Eric and Caro to rejoin us and and maybe kind of just continue on where we leave off here, um, which is you know, do either of you see a space for this CG in in the spaces you work in? Like Eric, do you ever see a reality show being? fully digital going into like that, that box I, and filming. I think, I think it'd have to be a very specific format, right? Because as we've been talking about, you have to be as a personality, as a character on, a, on an unscripted project, you have to be authentic, right? And if you're in an inauthentic environment, it has to be there to accentuate your own personal authenticity. I think that's the only way to do it. You know, somebody pitched me during COVID, hey, we should just do our weddings for Married at First Sight. In, with an Unreal Engine. I'm like, well, first of all, we don't have the budget for that. And second of all, I feel like we bring in a bunch of everyday average people into a big LED cave, they're not gonna have the same experience that you're gonna have at a real wedding at a real venue. You know, it's, you're gonna go through the motions, but it's gonna feel a lot more like a set than it is a real place. And, you know, I think that the idea that Steve, you brought up about audio and, getting deep fake audio or interview bites into an unscripted show, that's dangerous, you know, because, you know, manipulating what somebody says, what their intention was, you can do that. But I think as a production company and as a producer on an unscripted project, you can quickly lose a lot of credibility if you get into that business where you might be able to make something interesting, but no one's going to want to work with you if you if you start doing that to someone's detriment. Carol, I recently was exposed to Clothe 3 d which I don't know if you've seen it yet, but it's a 3D design software specifically for the clothing space, right? And production or product design. Um, in fact, we're going to be talking about that next month on the same series. Um, but I, it, one of the things that they can do is create what is in essence an NFT of a, of a garment that you as an influencer can put on because their argument is 14% of the garments that you wear are as an influencer are just for that. And then you throw them away. Yeah. You, you digitally put this garment on yourself. Would you like, is that interesting to you? I mean, yes, I feel like, okay. Technology doesn't always have to be so scary. I feel like it can be helpful. I feel like if I can try on an outfit and just show people how it looks like that would make everything much easier. And if I actually really like that outfit, I would just go get it. And then they can get some actual nice, you know, video of me wearing the outfit. But I do think it's kind of scary that like videos, you can manipulate them and like change things. Because for me, like, you know, as an influencer, when it comes to posting photos, like I can edit somebody out of the background. I can change a few things. But when it comes to videos, I'm like, I didn't know that was possible. So that's quite crazy. Steve, is that, I mean, is that where we're going? Can it, can it? producer of a reality show or a, an influencer have everything changed on them? Oh yeah, I mean, there's no question. It's already, I mean, the, tw the 15 years ago, uh, I was asked to meet with the, um, there was a guy apparently in China because they only allowed like eight movies a year into China at the time or something like that. And he was the guy that decided what was gonna come in. <clears throat> and 
we were showing him clips from Benjamin Button and he's he's through his translator he's sort of asking like so so Brad Pitt is not there at all and we're like nope no Brad Pitt in this frame at all and he's like uh okay so could you make Bill Clinton say something he never said and I was like okay no this conversation's over now but it was a precursor to exactly what we're talking about which is now, I mean, that would have been very expensive and I'm sure China would have paid for it, no problem. But, but now it's cheap. I mean, you can download an app that allows you to do this stuff now where you can put yourself into pretty much any movie that you want to. And it's pretty, pretty well done. It's cheap, it's fast. It doesn't take a lot of anything. And so when you start having that kind of power out there at that kind of price point, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't pretend to be a producer, but I can imagine there's producers out there that are like, something just went off in their head. That's like, I can do whatever I want, you know, with the audio, with the video, with these people, with what they're saying, what they're doing. I mean, I've, scary. from the day I heard about for deep fakes, I was just like, this is, this is bad. This is a well, bad thing for this world. And it's becoming so accessible to the consumer. I mean, this bug on the screen with me is done through a snap filter, right? That I, that I was able to create, me was able to create. When looking at those snap filters, you see like the hair is becoming more real. It, it really is, it's giving me hair where I have none. You know, it's, it's a benefit for me, but it, I mean, it's, there's some interesting like thoughts on this that, that are, we've gone down a, a, a dark hole here. I, maybe let's go to a more uplifting piece of it, but what, what are some of the good things that you all are seeing outside of this space coming in the future of entertainment? Back to where we started, you know, like looking at what you're doing as an influencer, what you're doing in the content you're creating, in the, in the visual effects you're bringing. Um, what are we seeing that is exciting in entertainment in the next five to 10 years? You know, Eric, do you want to start? Sure. I think that, you know, like what we're saying about a deep fake engine or that kind of technology that it's sort of being democratized that it's available to people i think the same thing can be said about content creation in general and the quality at which people can who are not high paid studio executives can make content and make it look great and it can live on a platform as polished as netflix or as lo-fi as sometimes youtube can look content's everywhere and i think that 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 sort of leveled playing field, you never know what the next great idea is going to be. And to, that people are able to get in and more voices can be heard and more diverse voices can, can come forward, I think it's, it's great. And that's what I'm most excited about because the storytelling for a long time in this industry, unscripted or scripted, has been controlled by a small group of network executives. Mm -hmm. And even though we are seeing consolidation, you look at what's happening at NBC Universal and, and how they're merging brands together, Oxygen, Bravo, E, you know, how that all sort of combines into one team now. I still feel like there are more outlets than ever and more opportunities than ever to, to get content out there. And then when it comes to brands, more opportunities for you to, to, to interact with that content and an and opportunity for small scale things to blow up into big scale things. You never know what's going to hit. But it also brings me to mind like this, this democratization to your point exactly. It, it, those rooms that you were talking about were, were dominated by a particular looking person uh, who happened to be a white male. And so the perspectives were different. And so Caro, to you, I wonder if being able to bring your perspective on life with everything you bring, I mean, mm -hmm. that's part of your authenticity that your audience mm -hmm. I'm sure is, is refreshed to see. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, like yes content like what everybody gets to see like the media whether it's a show or advertisement whatever it was always a particular type of person so you know coming in the bottom with my natural hair mm -hmm. doing all these things and also following all these people that are talking about the natural hair just following this diverse group of people that you usually don't see in media is super refreshing. And it makes people feel like, yay, like I can fit in, I can relate to this content because before you're like, okay. And you kind of like want to disconnect yourself from that content because you don't relate to it. It kind of just makes you feel bad about yourself. It's like, oh, I don't look like that. But now you're seeing people that look like you and you're like, I can relate. I can, I can feel what she's feeling. 
you know? So I definitely do like that, that right now, and I feel like even in the future is gonna be even more and more and more diverse. Cause I feel like we didn't reach our, you know, diversity perfection right now. I still feel like it's a little imbalanced, but in the future, it's definitely going to be more. Steve, I'm gonna give you the last word, which means you either get to go really exciting or like scare us. So why would you, you go really, like why wouldn't you go really exciting with Caro? Like I'm the old but this is my real hair, by the way, but like you should have <laughs> ended also, there. <laughs> go ahead. Thoughts, no thoughts, just future. That where are we 10 years from now? Where do you think? Hopefully I'm retired, but um I mean I I I do agree with Eric. I really and have been excited ever since like the red released their first camera where it was like almost a affordable cinema level camera where you know you could get creative people that just wanted to make things instead of having to go through the the studio process and, and make things and you know some of my favorite films of last year were i mean they were still large budget in terms of what someone could just go shoot in their backyard but like you know three million dollars they made you know palm springs or something like that um i also Personally, though I work in the film industry, I like the fact that things are becoming more um, uh, series, things that are streaming, because I think you can develop the story a lot better and you can sort of, you don't have an hour and a half for two hours or in the case of some movie makers, four hours to make a story. Like I, you know, I prefer to get it in smaller doses and, and something that can be stretched out even among multiple seasons. Um, from a technology standpoint, I think, <clears throat> you know, we've been doing things very much the same for a number of years. I mean, LED walls, I think, are are interesting, but I don't think it's going to really be a seismic shift in how we do things. So I don't think my industry will be that different 10 years from now. Um, you guys have already after. disrupted everything. So Yeah. What's yeah. that? You've already done the disruption. So, you know, you can, you can rest on it. Let us all deal with it for 10 years and then, then do it again. <laughs> it wasn't my fault. <laughs> uh, the three of you are so fascinating. And I so appreciate you spending a bit of time with us to share these stories, your experiences, your life stories. Um, Steve, Eric, Carol, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, just a brief kind of connection to the college, because maybe you're thinking, how does all of this connect back to what we do at FITM? Um, we, we have a program in entertainment, set design and decoration. We also have digital marketing, we have digital media, we have digital cinema degrees that we all offer here at the college. And so it all comes together. And especially as we see this convergence, I just, I just wanna kind of underline the point that, that that's what we are looking at here at the college and part of the reason we enjoy hosting this series. So thank you to the three of you for helping us make all these connections to our, our audiences and friends. Uh, next month, we're going to again discuss the future, but it's the future of design. More on that 3D software, Clo3, which if you've not learned about it yet, I'm excited to share it with you. We'll also talk a little bit about NFTs. There was a great uh, New York Times podcast this morning, The Daily, talked about NFTs. Take a listen to it if you want to learn a bit more before we go into that conversation next week. As I mentioned, we have the uh, Mank set decoration panel on Thursday. You will get a link to that, as well as a link to next month's future of, and a link to this month's video recording uh, in a day or so. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. To my three panelists, thank you. And until we meet again, I encourage you all to stay inspired. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, Tom. Thank you.